Okay, we are testing this one. Testing, testing. How does it sound? Yeah. Do we need to test this one? No, I can hear myself. That's great. Okay, good morning and welcome everyone on a very rainy, wet day. Um, my name is Mieko Kamno. I'm professor in artistic doctoral studies in Dokmus Doctoral School at Sibelius Academy. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor John Rink. Uh, he is Professor of Musical Performance Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he has published many books, many editions, as well as having been the principal investigator for some of the key research projects in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he is also the um, jury member for the last and forthcoming Chopin International Piano Competition. Um, in addition to all of his achievements and the wide-ranging activities, I'd like to mention that he's somebody who cares about the community, about the research community, which is very much reflected in today's presentation, the title, Between Practice and Theory, Performance Studies and as Artistic Research. His presentation is going to last about 50 minutes, so um, I'd like to swiftly move on to his presentation. So please welcome Professor John Rink. much to Professor Kano for the introduction and thank you even more to the Sibelius Academy for the invitation to present this paper today. Um, I'm returning to the Academy after 19 years. I was here in 2001 and spent several days working with Dokmo students, giving papers and generally being impressed by the work of the Sibelius Academy. And since then, of course, the work of the Academy has grown to even greater uh, proportions uh, with even more wonderful results. So my congratulations to the team on what has been achieved over these last two decades. My uh, paper today uh, is based upon a publication that will soon appear. Uh, the um, article in question has the same title as today's talk. It's in a book called Remixing Music Studies. And as you can see, it's a festschrift for Nicholas Cook, who will turn 70 this year. Um, the title of this presentation is a direct response to the title of Nicholas Cook's own article, published the very year I came to the Sibelius Academy, 2001. His paper was called Between Process and Product, Music and as Performance. Mine is Between Practice and Theory, Performance Studies and as Artistic Research. So it is a response to that early landmark publication of Nicholas Cook. Um, and of course, it's also a kind of thank you to Nicholas Cook uh, for what he's achieved himself. There are also other points of reference and correspondence. Um, I'm going to start with some brief remarks about a paper I gave and then a, a chapter I published called The State of Play in Performance Studies, which itself was responded to and built upon several years ago by Ian Pace, the new state of play in performance studies. Now, in a sense, this presentation today could be called the even newer state of play in performance studies, but I think that would start to get a bit ridiculous. Instead of that, what I want to do is to explore this and-as dichotomy in the title between the fields of performance studies and artistic research. And as you will hear, I'm going to explore some of the possible tensions as well as the potential rapprochement between the two. I'm going to read a formal script, which I tend not to do in giving papers, but I wanted to partly because it's based on the chapter and partly to develop the ideas in question. 
I'll go back for a second. Almost 20 years ago, after a paper I'd given at the Royal Musical Association conference entitled Performance 2000, Nicholas Cook asked a question as provocative as it was memorable. Did I think that those working in musical performance studies should actively seek its demise on the basis that a discrete area within musicology would no longer be needed once the values and practices of the emerging subdiscipline had been embedded more widely? I've pondered ever since whether such obsolescence would be desirable, and I still do not have a definitive answer. But one thing is certain. Over the intervening two decades, research in musical performance studies has continued to burgeon with no immediate end in sight, nor as yet the broad assimilation alluded to by Nicholas Cook. This paper reflects on what has been achieved over the last two decades, though it is not intended to be a comprehensive stock-taking exercise. Nor was that the aim of either the chapter that emerged from the conference paper I mentioned, the one published in 2004, or Ian Pace's sequel, which is a review article describing this new state of play as of 2017, but in fact primarily focused on Nicholas Cook's book Beyond the Score from four years earlier, 2013. Instead, here I will highlight certain frictions within musical performance studies, which, as we'll see, can still be regarded as a, quote, fragmentary scene, as Jonathan Dunsby characterized the fledgling discipline back in 1995, though for quite different reasons. One aim of the discussion that follows is to articulate an agenda for performance studies with a view to generating greater internal synergy and to finding a way out of the corner into which some have painted themselves. In 2004, I chose to concentrate on three overlapping domains within the field, historical performance practice, psychology of performance, and analysis in performance. 13 years later, Ian Pace identified no fewer than nine subdomains within an increasingly broad field of inquiry, including performance as research and performance-based research and its continental European counterpart, artistic research into performance, which he says is generally undertaken by practitioners and requiring a practical element. Musical performance studies has also forged a wide range of connections with other disciplines, including theatre studies, social and cultural anthropology, philosophy, and so on. Now, it would be fruitless to search for and naive to expect coherence across this plane, nor is there harmony between even the most closely associated domains, hence the fragmentation to which I have alluded. In part, this results from the use of political and polemical discourse in the literature, which creates ideological antagonisms that conceivably might have been avoided. Pace's article is a case in point. While noting that Nicholas Cook's book is, quote, a work of huge erudition and breadth, Pace levels a series of criticisms which are both contentious and contradictory. His accusation of Nicholas Cook's anti-intellectualism is especially surprising. Of all people, Nicholas Cook, anti-intellectual. The point here is not so much to defend Cook and his ostensible school of thinking, as Pace calls it, as to observe that the discourse in this review article is unconstructive if its aim is to resolve the, quote, territorial disputes and arguments that Pace himself seemingly wishes to transcend and for which the Charm Research Center in particular is blamed. Nor is it helpful in terms of encouraging, as, as Pace puts it, greater and freer exploration in modern post-Charm performance studies, which again is one of Pace's stated aspirations. But his polemical stance is far from unique. 
Indeed, recent literature and performance studies exudes tensions of all kinds, engendered by a range of factors. Mine Doantandak, for one, notes that researchers in the field are increasingly pitted against one another as competitors and pressurized to prioritize benefiting a corporate or organizational interest. Dorothea Fabian similarly discerns a growing tension between two camps, namely between musicologists and those conducting practice-based research. Other tensions that surface within this broad spectrum of activity are of longer standing, between performers and composers on the one hand, and on the other, between performers and the institutions and norms that can dictate, some would say distort, their practice. Cook recently lamented that the rhetoric of composers' intentions is equally characteristic of mainstream performance, which has the curious consequence that nobody is in greater denial of the creativity of performance than performers. Moreover, according to Doan Tandak, the idea that correct performance expression inheres in notated pitches and rhythms constitutes a totally rare moment of agreement between musicologists, music theorists, music psychologists, and listeners. For her, such an agreement forms the moral basis of a regime sustained by what Daniel Leach Wilkinson has called the performance police, namely teachers, critics, producers, promoters, directors, agents, managers, etc., all of whom supposedly take the composer's side in conspiring against the liberty of performers. A recent study by Paolo de Assis goes so far as to assert that performers willingly adopt the role of happy slaves, oblivious to their almost complete absence of creative freedom. He adds that the vast majority of young music students do not enter conservatoires in order to learn how to think critically or how to act creatively or spontaneously. Instead, they enter conservatoires to learn all the codes and rules, all the prescriptions and opinions that will enable them to occupy a predetermined role in society, well-behaved and tamed. Ian Pace, too, attacks what he calls the culture of the conservatoire, more hierarchical and less democratic than that of the university. Sometimes, he says, breeding desperation, fear, callous exercise of charismatic authority, abuse, bullying, and much more, and the extension of these principles into the world of professional performance. That is his view. Now, these descriptions chime to only a limited degree with my own postgraduate experience in a London conservatoire 40 years ago, the Guildhall School in London. But my aim here is neither to support nor deny such claims, nor will I discuss them in any detail. Instead, I wish simply to note the highly charged tone of recent scholarly writing about musical performance and the institutions surrounding it, and more specifically, about the broad field of performance studies. In connection with the latter, one frequently encounters a polarizing tendency on the parts of those devoted to artistic research, the aims of which, Luke Weiss, among others, distinguishes from those associated with what he calls performance studies methods of observation and analysis. It's sort of put out there as a not very positive scientific type of thing. A similar dichotomy was implicit in an email I received a couple of years ago, informing me about a professorship in the field of, quote, music performance studies, as distinct from the newer academic field of performance studies, end quote. So we had a distinction between music performance studies and academic performance studies. This troubled me. Doan Tandak observes that from the moment of their inception, Discourses of artistic research have been permeated by political judgments, whether these are explicitly stated or remain as unarticulated assumptions. In his introduction to a volume of essays recently published by the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, Jonathan Impet admits 
that, quote, the very term artistic research in music has been contentious. He elaborates. Put simply, instead of being research about making music, it is research conducted through making music. We might begin with self-identification. Rather than constraining the future by inventing dogma, we can observe and reflect upon the approaches, themes, and commonalities that emerge. Distinctions between, for example, practice-based or practice as research, some applied to musicology or aspects of music creation, depend very much on the terms and dynamics of the knowledge economy within, work, within which the work takes place. Impet's thinking, and it seems that of many of the contributors to this Orpheus volume, is encapsulated in his description of artistic research as, quote, the very embodiment of critical theory in practice. Now, I should say that if you read the book, you'll see that it's particularly French critical theory, and it's high-powered French critical theory. This surprising and rather extreme claim, in the light of that use of French critical theory, contrasts vividly with the accusations often made about the supposedly inadequate conceptual underpinnings of and supposed lack of methodological rigor in artistic research, along with occasional claims that its outcomes are neither generalizable nor verifiable. People are always attacking artistic research for these supposed properties. It's possible that a theoretically intensive approach was deliberately taken in the Orpheus book in order to deflect such accusations. But ironically, the price to be paid is a distancing from the thinking and practice of most performers, professionals and amateurs alike. So we have a book that's supposedly about performers, for performers, but which will be very difficult for performers to understand. And I have to say I have difficulties with it myself in that respect. This by no means robs the book and similar work of all its value, but it does call into question whom it is for and what it is trying to achieve. It is no less ironic that while some in the field of artistic research have sought to transcend charges of narrowness and superficiality by steeping themselves in theory, those using the so-called performance studies methods of observation and analysis cited by Luke Weiss in order to gain understanding of what Jonathan Dunsby once called real pragmatic issues, have themselves been branded as interlopers or, as we have seen, as anti-intellectual. So people like me who use these performance studies methods of observation were, were not considered real enough by some people in this artistic domain. So it goes back and forth, a struggle. Unnecessary struggle, I'm going to say. An interesting volt fast change of mind can be discerned in Nicholas Cook's book, Beyond the Score, where the author reevaluates one of my own publications from 1999 by acknowledging that his earlier judgments about it had been framed in terms of what he dubs theorists' analysis rather than performers' analysis, which I myself first wrote about in 1990 and which Cook discusses at length in his book. Nevertheless, a strict opposition between these types of analysis, theorists and performers, would be hard to defend, not least because, again quoting Cook, this time from 2015, theory and practice do not divide up neatly. Furthermore, as he argues, attempts to draw distinctions between academic work and artistic practice ignore what Fiona Candlin calls both the practical elements of theoretical writing and the theoretical aspects of art practice. That is why Gertrude Sandqvist, for one, refers to a pair of concepts that she would never be able to use with regard to artistic research, the division into theory and practice. Hence my own between, by the way. Stepping back from these debates and dichotomies, I would advocate more cooperation and less Resistance, a term used in the very title of this Orpheus anthology, more cooperation and less resistance between the domains within musical performance studies as a whole, which could easily end up at loggerheads in conflict unless action is taken, or rather unless new attitudes towards difference are adopted. 
there is a fine line between conducting research through the practice of musicians, in the words of the Orpheus Institute, and conducting research about the practice of musicians using other music uh, methodologies. Moreover, I feel that musical performance studies will always necessarily be a fragmentary scene. I see no alternative to eclecticism in this field. There are too many angles to be taken on musical performance of all types, and consequently, too many constituencies and subdomains for unanimity of outlook, judgment, and approach to be achieved. But that need not be a problem, provided that the fragmentation in question does not result from a politics of antagonism and exclusion. On the contrary, purposeful eclecticism, underpinned by more or less widely shared aims, most notably a desire to gain greater insight into what performance is, what performance signifies, and how we do it or might do it, this seems essential if a community is to flourish and if less highly charged state statements and stances are to be taken towards difference. What I am advocating, therefore, quoting this forthcoming publication, is tantamount to an equality, diversity, and inclusivity agenda within performance studies. If such an agenda itself seems political in nature, then at least its premises and goals are resoundingly positive. So what I'm trying to do, in short, is to fight this politics of antagonism and exclusion with a different sort of politics, which has to do with purposeful eclecticism towards difference, the acceptance, the championing of difference. I feel that this is an important political stance to take in the world of hate and opposition that we're encountering uh, around the globe, but we don't need to get into detail because we all know too well the kinds of problems that are arising. In her recent book, Dorothea Fabian claims that music performance shows overwhelming similarities to the characteristics of complex dynamical systems. On that basis, she argues for a model that engages not only with the various elements and aspects of performance, but importantly, with the interactions of these. There is a need, Fabian insists, for multimodal and transdisciplinary, comprehensive accounts that are data-driven, yet embrace the phenomenological and cultural if we wish to lessen the problem of verbalizing an embodied oral experience. That's the big challenge. How do you verbalize this? This, in turn, she says, would require a method that engages with music performance in its complexity. Although such comprehensiveness is undeniably seductive, a kind of holy grail, if you will, I personally am not optimistic about the potential of any single analysis to elucidate all elements of performance from all possible angles, from all possible vantage points. Hence my advocacy of this eclecticism and complementarity across the field of research. Likewise, my commitment to the cultivation of what Remy Campo calls a constructive arena, a space where the confrontation of ideas would outweigh either the temptation to standardize concepts or the potential production of a form of Babelian frustration. We're all speaking in different tongues and don't really understand each other. Nevertheless, I would query Campos' character characterization of that space as one that, quote, could lead to the development of competing theoretical frameworks. As I've indicated, I encourage not competition, but complementation and synergy between, among other things, the comprehensive maximalist approaches to the study of musical performance urged by Dorothea Fabian, which push beyond traditional disciplinary boundaries, and at the other end of the scale, relatively circumscribed micro-approaches yielding intentionally limited results that might nevertheless inspire new research questions with broad repercussions. So rather than trying to do everything all at once, we try to do small things but with broad repercussions that potentially expand well beyond the limitations of the micro-study. Neither of these approaches would be adequate in themselves. 
hence the need for both, if not more. Now, the case study that I'm going to present in a second falls into the second of these categories, the micro, focusing on a singular performance by the pianist Alfred Brendel. It has the particular purpose of demonstrating how the separation sometimes posited in the literature between so-called academic researchers and artist researchers might be challenged or redressed. As an example of that alleged separation, consider Darla Crispin's recent observations that the work of the Research Center's CHARM in CMPCP, the Center for the History and Analysis of Recorded Music, and the center that I directed, the Center for Musical Performance as Creative Practice, her, her observation that this work, however welcome, still presupposes, she says, a separation between the researcher and the source material, even to the extent that the same person may function in one context as performer and in another as researcher into performance, with those two identities being kept deliberately distinct from one another. In contrast, she says, a performer or a composer asks the kind of questions that would not naturally occur to the researcher. Many of these are intensely practical and linked to the immediate physiological and psychological demands of composing or performing music. Although Crispin's comments seem reasonable enough on the face of it, I do not accept the distinction between performer and researcher identities th that she and others have proposed, not least because I myself am both a performer and a researcher into performance operating in these multiple spheres with what I personally regard as a unitary identity. I don't have two voices in my mind which speak to each other. What do you think about this, John? Well, John, I think it's this, you know, back and forth. I'm looking at things from one particular point of view, but with multiple manifestations. This unitary identity serves as the background to and the point of departure for the case study that I'll present now, which accordingly is intended to generate insights of potential relevance to researchers, to performers, and to performer researchers alike. In writing about Alfred Brendel in various contexts over the last two decades, Nicholas Cook has described a process of identification, conceptualization, and execution, which he claims to be the essence, as well as the raison d'etre, of performance analysis in general. I very much like that formulation, identification, conceptualization, execution. For example, in 2013, Cook referred to Brendel's idiosyncratic concept of foreshortening, which Cook himself once described as the idea that any significant structural point in the music is preceded by a series of phrases of diminishing length. He referred to this not as an unbalanced, <coughs> excuse me, unbalanced or unprofessional example of theorists' analysis, a genre for which Brendel has little use, but as something basically different namely, a means of identifying and conceptualizing the building and dissipation of tension, the convincing handling of which is fundamental to the performance of repertory such as this, what he was discussing. It is, in other words, a means of facilitating the control of pacing, in part by summarizing such musical dimensions as harmony, motive, and rhythm into a single representation, if you like, into a single gesture. Brendel himself has spoken extensively about the role of analysis as he develops an understanding of the music he is playing. And although he has acquired a reputation for shunning analytical inquiry, a different impression arises on closer inspection. For Brendel, analysis should be the outcome of an intimate familiarity with the piece rather than an input of established concepts. As if anticipating Cook's distinction between theorists' analysis and performers' analysis, Brendel later elaborated. I don't feel guilty about being intellectual, if that means thinking about the structure and character and humor in a piece of music. But I'm not talking about dry analysis, which is relatively easy if you know how. I do the opposite. I familiarize myself with a piece and wait for it to tell me what it's about and what makes it a masterpiece. Here again, Brendel considers familiarization to be critical, 
as he also implied in another interview. He said, as I mold my interpretation and conception, I play as instinctively as possible. Only later do I attempt to understand what I am doing, why I am doing it. Then I start correcting myself whenever necessary. Of course, he's analyzing what he's doing. He doesn't say it, but that's what he's doing. From that moment on, I am reassessing my findings as often as I can. I think these allusions to instinct should be taken with a pinch of salt. Instinct really doesn't operate here, but intuition certainly does. Um, at the submerged level of consciousness uh, Wallace Berry once described. What Brendel refers to as true analysis is therefore part and parcel of his work as a performer, involving the formulation of strategies directed at real-time action, as noted by Nicholas Cook. Brendel himself has elaborated on what this entails. He said, some people maintain that when you have grasped the structure, the character will come by itself. It is implied, but that is not at all the case. Finding the music's character and the ability to impersonate many different characters are vital for the performer. Now here, too, some sort of analysis is involved, as Brendel suggested in 1970. He said, whereas anyone can analyze musical form with some success, tracking down the character, the psychological processes of the music is more demanding. I find the link between character and what Brendel terms the psychological processes of the music highly intriguing. And intriguing, too, is his observation that although I find it necessary and refreshing to think about music, I am always conscious of the fact that feeling must remain the alpha and omega of a musician. Although Brendel's reference to feeling is no less arcane, difficult to understand, than others to character, psychology, and true analysis, what it represents is, at least for me, of the utmost significance. Feeling of this type is not a synonym for either emotion or physical sensation. Indeed, Jonathan Dunsby, writing in more general terms, confirms that Musical feeling for the performer is an amalgam of emotion and intelligence, of response and control, of empathy and command of the autonomic and proprioceptive. In other words, for Dunsby, feeling is an amalgam of being and doing. Evidence of embedded, assimilated feeling of this type can be inferred from the notes jotted down by Nicholas Cook during an open rehearsal in Cambridge in May 2011. Led by Alfred Brendel, who was coaching the Shimonovsky Quartet, the session illustrated what Cook calls how gesture, speech, and singing work together in open sessions of this type. During the rehearsal, Cook observed that, I'm sorry, it's such a long quote, but it's interesting. Cook observed that what Brendel says counts for less than what he sings and how he sings it. He vocalizes it, tru -tru -tru -tru. it might be a melodic motive or the bass line, but the pitches are barely perceptible. All you can be sure of is whether the notes go up or down. I, I was there, I was kind of thing. We've all worked with musicians, we, are musicians. we know these kind of thing. There's a strong expressive tremolo and the tone quality is exaggeratedly breathy, resulting in an oddly intimate version of Bart's grain of the voice. Depending on what he wants to communicate, there may be, again, exaggerated dynamic changes or an exaggerated emphasis on rhythm or articulation. This expressive croaking seems to come from deep within Brendel's body. There are, of course, elements of iconicity between what he sings and what he wants to hear. They resemble each other, in other words. But overall, the one stands for the other through a more complex form of representation. It makes me think of a caricature in the sense that a particular salient element is drawn out and foregrounded writ large. His singing leaves out everything but the expression. I would word that very differently. I would say his singing is the expression, but let's leave that to one side. In fact, my conclusions here about this deep expressive croaking have rather different uh, implications in general. For me, this sort of singing described by Cook tends to have little in common with the cultivated sounds one hears on the operatic stage or in countless other contexts, I mean, real singing. Instead, it is best understood as visceral, as primordial, 
both manifesting and inducing, manifesting and inducing feeling, as I've described it above. In fact, I even wonder whether embodied sound of this sort is what C.P. Ebach had in mind when referring over 250 years ago to a singing performance, when he advocated playing from the soul, not like a trained bird. If you've ever worked with great musicians, and I've had that, that privilege, and they all sing, and they sing in precisely the ways I just do, kind of thing, and boy, is it, is it powerful. <laughs> and you just have to listen to Glenn Gould recording, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the following commentary that I'm going to present focuses on what Cook has called this tensional and expressive shaping in Brendel's performance of the sixth of Schubert's Moment Musico recorded in June 1977 for television broadcast. This is all on YouTube, by the way. It's fascinating to see. Although I, I will mostly consider Brendel's playing, not the score, a little information about the, the piece as composed will be of use. The last of the Moment Musico dates from 1824, so four years before the set of six was published. Uh, it is in ternary or minuet form with the return of the opening section indicated in the score by Allegretto da Capo at the end of the trio section. So the first section is not written out. The fact that the da Capo recapitulation of section A, which I'll refer to hereafter as A prime, is not notated a second time means that it is at least notionally identical to the first statement of that section. Although, of course, by convention, the internal repeats would not be played. Interestingly, they are not played even the first time by Brendel, which means that in his recording, the two outer sections have precisely the same phrase structure. For the sake of this discussion, I'm going to refer loosely to four phrases in sections A and A prime, respectively bars 1 to 16, phrase 1, which ends with the repeat sign not taken by Brendel, bars 17 to 39, phrase 2, 40 to 53, phrase 3, and 54 to 77, phrase 4, with the repeat going back to bars 17. Again, not taken by Brendel. Each of these phrases, apart from the third, depending on how you read the notation, is preceded by a one-beat anacrusis. The outer sections open in A-flat major, but end despondently in the parallel key, A-flat minor. Section B, a conventional trio, is in the subdominant D-flat major. So we'll look briefly at the score. Here's section A, which um, goes over to... Uh, this doesn't work there. No, it's not. Uh, section A ends over there. Section A with phrase one here, phrase two, phrase three, and phrase four shown on this screen. Section B, the, the trio, Mark trio, in fact, uh, is shown here, um, again with a repeat sign at the end going back internally, and then, as you can see at the end, the Allegretto, Allegretto da Capo. Although many features of Brendel's performance might warrant discussion here, I'm going to concentrate on this tensional and expressive shaping at the level of form, which is to say, on the real-time structure that Brendel creates in and projects through the performance. Now, that's an important thing, the real-time structure. You're going to hear me talk about structure not as inherent in the score, but as something created, something perceived, constructed and perceived. What Brendel does is to generate a sense of large-scale progression through his treatment of the recapitulated A section, which sounds fundamentally different from the so-called same music when first performed. The fact that it is so different is obvious to the ear, but to grasp where and how the variances occur is challenging as the piece unfolds, even upon repeated listenings. So a more detailed investigation is called for, starting with the performance as, to, as opposed to the more typical page-to-stage approach. So basically the challenge is we hear this performance, we recognize that it's different, but in what way? So I'm going to do a little bit of analysis, as it were, um, but of a different kind, starting with the performance. <clears throat> a rough and ready calculation of the durations of the corresponding phrases within sections A and A prime yields the data shown in this table. 
these timings were very crudely done. I just sort of measured them off of YouTube. They could be finessed with Sonic Visualizer or some other software. But they reveal, interestingly, that section A prime is significantly slower. So phrase one is five seconds slower. Phrase two is roughly the same length, although you'll hear that it's very different in nature. Phrase three, three seconds shorter, which is quite a lot in uh, proportion. And then phrase four is massively longer, 47 seconds versus 38 seconds. But these timing deviations are only the most striking and the most readily quantifiable difference. In, attempt, in an attempt to demonstrate how profoundly Brendel recharacterizes A prime and thereby calibrates the overall pacing, this issue of pacing again being critical, what I have done is to remix the performance. Remember that this is uh, from a chapter about remixing music studies. So this notion of remixing has a, a broader resonance. What I've done here is to remix the performance in order to compare the com corresponding phrases side by side rather than in the composed sequence of events. The composed sequence of events unfolds as in the top uh, 1A, phrase 1, 2, 3, 4, and then eventually 1, 2, 3, 4. What I've done and what you're going to hear is phrase one compared to phrase one in the recapitulation, phrase two and then phrase two, three and three, four and four. Hearing these respective phrases in juxtaposition proves to be both revelatory, uh, revelatory both analytically and practically. So let's look now at these phrases in juxtaposition as I've shown. This is again from 1977, the German uh, television broadcast. Phrase two. Phrase three. Phrase four.
don't really want to speak after that. <laughs> As you'll have seen, Brendel's body is hunched tight in A prime, whereas initially in section A, his physical demeanor appears almost relaxed. He adopts a much quieter dynamic in the recapitulation, foregrounding different parts with great poignancy. The articulation in this recapitulation is less forthright, more cautious, more muted, especially towards the end of phrase three, where the tenor part asserts itself, at once defiant and resigned. In A prime, Brendel tends to delay the successive downbeats after the anacruses, thus defying the expectations he'd created earlier and making the music tentative, provisional. The cadences, too, are drawn out, and in the warmer, consolatory passage towards the end of phrase two, he also stretches the time as if to keep at bay the darker clouds looming on the horizon. Temporal stretching is all the more pronounced as the recapitulation of A winds down and draws its final breath as if literally expiring at the end of a musical journey characterized by feeling of the most profound kind. Now, my brief phenomenological description is more than mere indulgence. By making key features of the performance explicit, it offers a springboard to further investigation, paving the way for the articulation of research questions informed by, relevant to, and potentially elucidatory of artistic practice and with theoretical implications to boot. So I'm using my micro approach as the basis for something that might be much greater. Such questions could include the following. First, to what extent and by what means do performers create large scale shape, which is to say structure as process, by varying parallel passages in the music they are playing or singing? What does remixing comparable passages in given performances along the lines I've demonstrated reveal about either the performer's conception or our perceptions of the music, or both? How could such remixing be used as an analytical tool and or as a practical technique, whether by performers, researchers, or others? And how might we theorize the strategies directed at real-time action that musicians develop and implement by exploiting performance parameters such as dynamics, articulation, pacing, bodily projection, and so forth? And what insights would arise from a theory of this kind about what Sandquist termed practical artisanal moments of know-how and about music, about how music works more generally? This Brendel case study has tackled the first three questions here by considering the type of work in which both performers and listeners are engaged. Recall that sections A and A prime are identical in terms of the musical notation, which is to say that all of the distinctive features of section A prime in Brendel's performance emanate from Brendel himself. Moreover, he uses those features to create a musical trajectory which is also distinctive, unique, in its direction, contour, meaning, and effect. What we witness, therefore, is not just a performance of Schubert's piece, but the fruits of a collaboration of sorts between composer and pianist, involving the additional participation of the camera crew, set designers, lighting team, and so forth. Brendel's performance is not only creative, but collectively creative. To conclude, the foregoing study has employed what I've called a micro approach of the type that I identified earlier, one outcome of which is a set of questions ripe for future investigation. It has reflected and ideally achieved credibility by drawing upon the decades of experience that I myself have had as a performer with premises that are not only theoretical, but intensely practical in nature, linked to the immediate physiological and psychological demands of performing music, that quote from Dala Crispin. It is because of the ident unitary identity that I'm asserting as both a performer and as a researcher into performance that I am able, at least in principle, to show the basis as well as the consequences of another performer's decision-making. 
For that reason, and this is really the critical point here, it is my belief that this study can legitimately claim the status of artistic research, even though the performance on which it focuses belongs to another artist, and even if so-called performance studies methods of observation and analysis have been used alongside others. I believe, moreover, that there is considerable potential for a similar conjunction of identities competencies and paradigms to inform further research initiatives in musical performance studies. Although first, it would be beneficial, if not essential, to rethink the sometimes divisive characterizations thereof that we have witnessed and to dismantle the barriers that, we, that have been erected in recent years. So uh, what I'm arguing is that I'm doing artistic research, even though it's not my individual artistry. I'm talking about somebody else's performance, but it is still artistic research, reflecting and commenting upon my own artistry as well as that of the other person, with the potential to uh, reflect itself in artistic practice, my own or somebody else's by extension. The study, although modest in scope, it is quite micro, thus illustrates how those working in the field might resist the politics of competition, opposition, and exclusion that I cited before, which, if unchecked, could thwart, could block common cause, whatever its specific manifestation, and thereby threaten the ongoing evolution of this discipline. To achieve greater and freer exploration in modern post-charm performance studies will necessitate, I think, the framing and adoption of this equality, diversity, inclusivity agenda, just as I've outlined before. That would help those engaged in performance studies to avoid territorialism, as well as the hierarchization that has bedeviled musicology itself for so many generations. Once a broader commitment has been made to eclecticism and complementarity, which in turn would generate a more powerful head of steam in combating unnecessary fragmentation, there will be all the more incentive to, for musical performance studies to develop further, both as a research domain and in the comprehensive embedding of its values and practices. <clears throat> After all, the quest to understand what performance is, what it signifies, and how we do it or might do it can never really end. Accordingly, the performer, the researcher, and the performer researcher will always have more work to do. Thank you. very much. We have five minutes for a couple of questions. Hello, uh, I'm Mikko Metsälampi. So, so this is a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, this last point of yours, I was, uh, I have been wondering about uh, this aspect of, uh, let's say, humanistic and uh, 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 studies uh, uh, that have to do with music. Is uh, breadth also depth in uh, humanistic studies? Um, and uh, uh, this uh, point of yours also has to do with this uh, uh, ethos of um, uh, universities mm -hmm. uh, building common, uh, through commonalities. Well, these are my thoughts. I uh, would like to uh, ask about this uh, uh, breath uh, is death. So are you suggesting that uh, we, we uh, can achieve only one or do you think that breadth and depth are possible? Is that what you're asking me to talk about? Because um, I think we need both. Uh, yes, we need both. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking, okay, let's have a situation when uh, we are uh, uh, examining uh, a thing called D, and uh, uh, there's one person that studies only A, and uh, the other person is studying only B. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to understand what uh, what this D is, one should study both A and B. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, uh, D is 
uh, or this case uh, C, should be hidden from uh, uh, both uh, person A and uh, both person yes. B? I mean, um, I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily saying that uh, we have to do anything in particular and that we all have to speak the same language and so forth and so on. But what I'm saying is there's potential for much greater understanding if we do at least try to understand other people's languages. Um, it's a little embarrassing for me to say this in a conference which is in English, in Finland, where everybody speaks perfect English. Uh, I should be speaking perfect Finnish. But the point is, uh, trying to understand other people's languages is, is very important. But in this field of tension and opposition that I've portrayed, um, I think we're missing the fact that there are potentially common aims. That's a critical difference because between your A and B, who may be dealing with completely separate areas of inquiry, in the cases of particularly artistic research and so-called performance studies, we're, we're actually sharing certain common aims, which is to understand what happens in performance more completely and to be able to articulate it. I think that that's a common aim, although with different manifestations, as I said before. So what I'm arguing is that in this field of multiple possibilities, uh, which is indeed breadth, uh, we have the opportunity to learn from each other, and then to engage in greater depth within our particular areas on the light, in the light of what we've learned from others. That's the point. OK, thank you. I think you can throw that, can't you? <laughs> I, I hit at three heads a year ago, so I'm not. No, I, no. <laughs> health and safety considerations. Hi, my name is Sebastian Zelen, and I'm still trying to formulate this question really well, but I'm kind of thinking about this combination you have of being both a researcher and a performer. And how do you look at the potential, or, or what, how would you describe what happens when you learn a piece of music? What knowledge have you gained when you've actually embodied and <coughs> learned and learned to play a piece of music compared to studying it, reading about it, or listening to it? Because I feel like that's what a lot of us are doing, and that's a question of a lot of us are asking, that how can we actually formulate what we learn from the performance and the study of the music itself? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, we would need a lot more than a few minutes to <laughs> go to the full extent of it. Um, uh, I'll just give you a, a quick demonstration because uh, we, we put the piano up just in case uh, and I, I can't just let it sit there. Um, I've recently uh, given some lecture titles, uh, uh, one of which has been called Chopin, the Language of Infinity. Um, and in this uh, particular case study, I, I, I played uh, the um, Nocturne in um, uh, C minor, Opus 48, number one, and I talked it through. So just As a performer, of course, you can just go and play that if you, once you've learned the pieces. So what knowledge is gained from the act of performing it, practicing it, and so forth? Well, it, it's, it's a constant dialogue between the knowledge that is feeding into the performance and the knowledge that's coming out. For example, I could cite a passage from Chopin's student, Wilhelm von Lenz, who said that Chopin wanted, at the beginning, a question and answer kind of thing within the melody. So I understand that. That's going to affect uh, the way I might think about it and possibly the way I might even play the notes in question. I've had access to an annotated score uh, used by one of Chopin's students, the annotations coming from Chopin himself. So, for example, at the end of the first phrase, we have a crescendo as the line goes down when we would expect a decrescendo. We're getting l uh, lower and at the end of the phrase we expect it to tail off. Chopin marks in a crescendo. Uh, that itself is important in influencing 
my performance decision. But from that starts to emerge a whole set of, of uh, properties and uh, implications that would not uh, come from the researcher, having to do with timbral weighting, having to do with um, the layering of sound generally, um, all sorts of things that then could serve as the basis of further investigation. So um, by virtue of the prompt of the notation, or in this particular case, Chopin's annotation, I start thinking about things that then, through articulation, I uh, make available for others to consider, just as I might consider. So there's a constant feedback. This is why I myself see no necessary division. So I'm putting on my researcher hat, I'm putting on my performer hat, I'm in constant dialogue. Ideas give forth to something else, which then give forth to something else. I don't know if that answers your question, but in eight bars I've tried to demonstrate it anyway. I think it does, thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't resolve in the tonic, but there you are. <laughs> Just one very quick question, please. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, Tommy Blackwell from the folk music department. And um, I found it particularly uh, heartening to see and hear some of Brendel's views on familiarization and uh, kind of seemingly a quite uh, organic and not necessarily linear process because um, that I feel that mirrors very much my own experience mm -hmm. um, as a musician. Um, and I uh, very much echo your point on trying not to get too wedded to hats and identities. I feel coming from the folk music department, where often the role between performer and composer is far more blurred, um, that... Uh, need for kind of fitting into roles mm -hmm. within uh, <coughs> performance, make, uh, performing music or performing arts um, is often uh, not very helpful. And I wonder whether you've had any thoughts, particularly whether you've talked about the division between performer and researcher. Um, do you feel there might be any uh, parallels in potentially an artificial? division between performer and composer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I alluded to some of those divisions uh, early on in the paper, in fact, a kind of antagonism that's sometimes been sensed. Um, I mean, I don't think we should conclude from any of this that we should all try to be the same person and that we're all the same. That's not, that's not the point. Um, but um, where we have sensed difference and... Um, stop there. I think, I think we need to reevaluate. That's really all I'm saying. Um, in the research center that I directed, uh, one of the projects was focused on performer-composer collaborations. And it was extremely enlightening uh, to have a series of pairings um, and, and groups um, involving performers and co composers working together in defining the new music. And the performer's role in that was actually very critical. It wasn't just that the composer dictated what the music should be. It was a very much iterative back and forth process. So um, uh, that's just one tiny example of the kind of work that performers and composers are doing together. So I think that there's plenty of reason to be optimistic about this. Um, one of the things that we've dedicated ourselves to um, in that center and in the uh, performance studies network that's emerged from it is is exactly the creating of a sense of community. Now, in a community, again, you're not looking for identical people making it up. You're looking for variegation, for variation across them, but a kind of, just as we were saying earlier, a kind of willingness to engage and have dialogue, um, which, uh, I mean, all of these thoughts are very much conditioned by our political situation across the globe at the moment, where we're doing just the opposite from that, of that. So you can see where it's coming from. Performers and composers are part of the community and, and of course, not only need to get along, but um, often do. They all, all haven't always. I mean, think of some of the famous quotes of Schoenberg and uh, Stravinsky and so forth about the, the performer is like children meant to be seen and not heard kind of thing. Uh, performers meant to be heard but not seen <laughs> or whatever. I think we've moved well beyond that kind of thinking. I hope. <laughs> With that, 
Thank you very Thank much you. for an exciting paper and presentation. So, applaud to <laughs> Professor Jeff again. And Samli has a short announcement. Yes, next we will have a, a lunch break, and after that we will have a, a after lunch concert. And it is not here, but it is in, in Hakasalmi Villa, that is the next building on the other side of that road there, in that direction. And the concert starts at one o'clock, so I, I really hope that you, you come early there, because if all of you will come there at three to one, then, then it's not going to start at one o'clock. Uh, and if you have a museum card, Museo Corti, please use that one. You have to pay for the entrance, but it's free if you have a museum card. And if you don't have, then I'll be there and I just put a mark and, and we will pay, pay the entrance fee for all of you. So we'll see at one o'clock or 10 to one at at Hakasalmi Villa, and we continue here at 14.30. Thank you.